Okay, so what I'd like to do is to talk to you a bit about some of the ongoing research that I've been engaged in uh, looking at the relationship between architecture, built environments uh, on the island of Cyprus and some of the revolutionary social changes uh, that were taking place there during the late Bronze Age. And, I mean, this crowd, I don't really need to probably show this, but there it sits. Very central role in the Middle East or Mediterranean. Uh, be, be forgiven for not knowing much about the Great Bronze Age Cyprus, as it does tend to get somewhat overshadowed by its more illustrious uh, neighbors. And, uh, and Cyprus actually lagged rather far behind uh, in terms of the development of the hallmarks of civilization. Uh, as much as uh, two millennia, when you look at, compare with, say, Mesopotamia or Egypt, and, and even a millennium when you're looking at the Levant uh, and the, the Mycenaean the known civilizations of the, the Aegean. Uh, but it's during this like, Bronze Age that Cyprus sort of catches up rather rapidly, and um, we see a number of really important developments in terms of the emergence of uh, elites and stratified society. We see um, uh, significant changes to uh, in terms of specialized systems of production and exchange that emerge, largely centered on the island's production of copper, becomes a major source of copper produced in Mediterranean during the late Bronze Age. And uh, related to that, of course, is that it becomes very much enmeshed in an important part of the socio, uh, sort of political, economic dynamics of, of the wider. Uh, Eastern Mediterranean area, and uh, you know, we know, for instance, it was called Al Shia according to textual sources during this period. The king of Al Shia had regular correspondences with the Pharaoh of Egypt, the king of Egypt, and other uh, such personages. Uh, so rapid changes on the island at this time, and at the same time, sort of what I'm interested in, we see a lot of changes to the island's architecture, its built environment, and we see the emergence of new types of housing. Uh, new types of domestic architecture, new types of mortuary architecture, with sort of ashlar. <laughs> uh, what I've been looking at mainly have been the, also the emergence of monumental buildings and uh, constructed with ashlar masonry. And where are all these things found? They're found in new cities, at, uh, urban centers that emerged for the first time in the island during this period. And so the question I've been sort of interested in is, well, you know, are, are, are these changes to the built environment, are they just sort of symptoms of or derived from these other political economic sort of changes? Or are they part of what's driving the social change of that? And I've taken the latter position in a number of uh, publications and other uh, uh, media. And uh, just a bit of theory, how, how to approach this, this issue, and just a bit of theoretical background. I won't of this, but I sort of see these new built environments as, as places, as lived space, if you will, as opposed to just space. Uh, and that they are both at once products and producers of social life on the island. So the, the <coughs> of these things are actually place making. And, uh, this speaks to, as you may recognize, aspects of Gordieu, Foucault, Anthony Giddens, and other social theorists in this kind of thinking. Uh, and particularly, I see uh, that uh, these new built environments are contexts for social interactions in which the power dynamics and identities uh, were changing, as power were being negotiated and, and displayed. And particularly, a lot of my dissertation work was based on looking at these uh, monumental buildings in particular, and how they served as contexts for things like ceremonial feasting and other ritual activities that uh, were a, a part and parcel of this social change that was taking place on the island. And, this is me to develop some methods to looking at the actual evidence on the ground, the buildings themselves. And uh, a big part of this was using access analysis. I didn't develop this method myself. This was developed actually at University of College London by Bill Hillier and Julian Hansen back in the 80s. And, uh, but it's a great way of sort of looking at a building, kind of dissecting it, and, and, and trying to lay bare its, um, the, the patterns of movement uh, through by reducing the, the rooms to circles and the connection points between them to lines. Uh, so it's great trying to figure out likely patterns of, 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 of privacy and of publicity in this, in this sort of thing. And uh, so there's a lot of social information embedded in these kinds of graphs you can drive. Uh, and you can just see how these two buildings look very much the same on the surface. When you move the doorways around and you get these remarkably different patterns uh, of these graphs. 
That only tells part of the story, though, and it strips out a lot of the details that environmental psychologists tell us are really important in how people interact with their built environments. So I've also been interested in looking at how built environments encode and communicate messages and meanings to people who use them. Uh, this is work by Amos Rappaport and others that uh, this is based on. And uh, particularly for Cypress, like Bronze Age, interested in the, uh, the use and placement of ashlar masonry and various types of ashlar masonry throughout these monumental buildings, for instance. Doorways, you know, these regular doorways, are they elaborated in some way? Are they, are they big? Are they small? Are there orthostats, thresholds, these kinds of things? They tell us a lot of information about the sort of intent behind the builders and, and, and making these built spaces. I've also been trying to integrate environmental psychology into this by uh, looking at work by, for instance, Edward Hall, one of the godfathers of environmental psychology, looking at proxemics, in other words, how distances affect how we interact with, with people and uh, how this changes both in terms of what we see here, that sort of thing over distances. And so we can look at uh, ancient rooms and buildings and, and knowing the size of these things, we can get some sense of as to what the parameters are for social interaction. And so trying to integrate that sort of work. And, uh, and, 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 and Hall's work certainly demonstrates that this is a very much a multi-sensory sort of thing, the way we interact with the built environment with each other in space. And so I tried to get that by looking at, if only in two dimensions at least at this point, um, various ways that we interact visually with these built environments. So looking at view sheds and isotopes fields in, inside that space. And uh, more recently, I've been trying to then take these individual monumental buildings and place them into their urban fabric. And this gets us into looking at cityscapes. And, and when I started to look at this, uh, I was. <coughs> The evidence we have for it is not nearly as, as good as I was thinking. And Ankeby, for instance, is one of the more famous sites in this period. 20% or so of it's been excavated, you think, this might be a great site to look at. But the problem is, all those lines of architecture there, we don't really know that most of those are, in fact, contemporary with one another. And the French who dig most of the digging there don't agree amongst themselves. So when you look at it, it looks great in some ways to work with, but uh, there's a lot of problems with it. And, and, other, and the other, most of the other sites are only maybe 5% or less of them are excavated uh, of other area and often in sort of discrete parts. So it's hard for us to make any conclusions about the urban fabric of any of these new cities that emerge at uh, this time. Hence my, my new project uh, that I've started up, the Calabasas and Moroni Built Environments Project, focusing on these two uh, nearby sites, seven kilometers apart on the south, central coast of the island. And uh, this is a collaborative project between, uh, I started when I was a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell University, uh, Stuart Manning, who is there, is my uh, co-director, and uh, we also brought, I think, a college, and uh, Michael Rogers, who's a geophysicist on board, and more recently, it's the uh, University of Arkansas Center for Advanced Spatial Technologies, where I had the pleasure of uh, spending a year down there uh, last year, um, are, are also on board as uh, partners. <coughs> and primary objectives of the project are to investigate the relationship between sort of the landscape, social interaction, social change on the island, and we're trying to integrate various data streams to bring on board some of these new digital technologies that I'm going to talk about, um, including geophysics, but also digital recording, 3D modeling, and spatial analysis. Uh, so the idea is to try to reconstruct these urban plans to a degree that will allow us to conduct sort of socio-spatial analysis uh, using some of these new, uh, new methods. Uh, we're also aiming to create an online publicly accessible database of our project data. We, we're committed to having all this stuff available publicly. Uh, this has not happened yet, but uh, we, we will see a space for it on our, on our website where it will go once we uh, get that done, hopefully late uh, this year. Uh, and certainly, uh, there's a bit of a pedagogical goal here all along with uh, student training in these new methods of data acquisition. And uh, I don't talk too much about the geophysics, but and, and I won't bore you with how it all works. As I, to be quite honest, I don't fully uh, understand this way of the geophysicists on the project. But what these methods allow us to do, essentially, is to look underground and cover large areas without having to dig. I mean, no one's going to let us dig a whole city at this point. So uh, we were able to use methods like ground penetrating radar and magnetometry to, to sort of look underground, detect things like urban infrastructure, without necessarily having to take. You do have to take the ground truth of things, as I'll show you, but you can cover large areas with this. Uh, here's uh, the, the areas we're working at. Uh, Calabasas over the left, uh, Moroni over uh, on, on the right. I'm not going to talk about Moroni today. I'll, I'll just concentrate on Calabasas in the interest of time. But uh, similar sites, exactly contemporary, 
1400 to 1200 BC or so, and um, close together, which allowed us to have all the equipment there and, 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 and sort of logistically handle uh, both sites. Hello, asshole, science Demetrios. Here it is. Uh, and I guess, I don't know, for better or for worse, the island's main highway runs right through, I mean, right through the middle of the site. And uh, this, it's not as grim as it sounds in that the highway corridor, yeah, there's a highway there, but everything else is actually a farmer's field. So it's not like it's been you know, developed McDonald's and things being placed, you know, the highway ramps and things. That happens about 10 minutes away from the site. Uh, but fortunately, uh, it is actually well preserved. And as part of the, the highway work, uh, excavations were done in the 70s and 80s uh, and into the 90s that recovered the architecture that you see there. So I didn't excavate this my team, so this week came in afterwards. Uh, they did find, though, um, several excavation areas with a north-south running road that runs through all three of those areas. Up in the northeast, you've got the administrative area with the monumental architecture of Building 10, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, two areas of elite architecture, uh, the domestic type sort of architecture, and then uh, what's been described as in the lower <coughs> off in the uh, western part of the site. Building 10 seems to be the administrative center. Oh, that's a little bit. <laughs> Give me, I'm sorry, I didn't plug this in. I didn't even use the battery quite that quickly. <laughs> Pithos Hall, as it's been called, that each one of these uh, stands would have held one of these person-sized pithoi, and gas chromatography analysis suggests they were all full of olive oil, amounting to over 33,000 liters. So a very significant um, uh, uh, statement of economic control of power here by the leads who uh, built Building 10. So we were interested in how does it articulate with the rest of the site. So this blank area in here, we, we, we began our geophysical survey. Just um, what ground penetrating radar does is essentially, essentially allows you to have a, a slices through the ground. So imagine you're looking down on it, starting at the surface, modern surface, and these are slices going down several centimeters for each one. And I'll just, the one that's shown in, in, in red, I want to just show you in, in its context. Uh, and you can see, I think, uh, the, the walls are the, sort of in orange, the architecture that is detected. And uh, you get the, the road continues quite nicely. It starts down here in the excavation area. It's up here. And then you can see that it actually continues rather nicely through the buildings on the side. And we were drawn to, when you get to this point in the road, is this building or structure in the middle of it. And here's our interpretation. This gives you a better sense of maybe what's going on there. And so we were kind of interested in, is this an attempt to constrict access to this northeastern part where the monumental buildings are? Uh, and so this is, this is one of the uh, areas we're interested in, in terms of how the, how the uh, urban environment constricts movement and, and access. Uh, more recently, we've, we've, we've used some new ground penetrating radar methods, much more intensive survey with it, and found a previously undiscovered monumental building over here. And I think you'll agree that I mean, the, the resolution you're going to get with the instruments, I mean, you could draw the plan from that without having to, to excavate. And better still, my, uh, this, is one of my, this was one of those eureka moments when we pulled this uh, image together. This is a sort of pseudo 3D image of, of that building. And uh, just a little sketch up model, show you what the rough ground plan. Uh, and so I can definitely do the kinds of socio spatial analysis I'm interested in why, without having to, to excavate using these, these methods. Uh, but, to make sure, you do have the data. So, we, uh, the University of Arkansas Field School, this summer, excavated a small swath of a 10 by 3 meter section of that building, and it indeed, indeed did confirm the geophysical results 
uh, and uh, lots of spectacular finds, ceramic finds in, uh, in, inside this interior room. We still didn't get to the floor by the end of the season, so we'll continue that work uh, in the future. Also, uh, the other area where I mentioned there was that sort of possible building out and blocking the roadway we were interested in, so we excavated a 10 by 2 meter uh, across that to try to, again, ground truth and to confirm or see, see how the geophysics was, uh, whether, whether, whether it was telling us uh, really what was down there. And this was a, uh, we, we did find the road and the rooms on either side that we expected, but this, this we were calling it a gatehouse originally, we didn't know what else to call it, it was a you know, quotation mark to the question mark after sort of thing. Um, but we just found a, a bunch of paving stones, and there's the road. And, and so the, the, we thought there'd be something coming out of the road up to like this point, and it's not there. And so this is interesting, and it tells us, of course, the geophysics, uh, it, it can detect things that are not necessarily always contemporary, archaeologically speaking. So what we're likely enough to do is section that road, and I think we'll find the thing jutting out of the road below <coughs> this here. But again, we ran out of time to do that. But it does point out that you know, when you look at the geophysics plot, not all that stuff is necessarily contemporary, even if it's aligned correctly. So that's, that's, that's an issue. The other major digital component for our project has been to use laser scanning as a means to rapidly and accurately record the extant architecture that was excavated before we even got there. So we've been using this wonderful instrument, the Leica Scan Station C10. It is a time of flight scanner. Which means basically it shoots lasers, not in a star, sort of star Trek sense, sat, as I sadly discovered. And there's no sound effect that goes with it. <laughs> you don't see it. Right? But it does this, it basically hits the object, flies back, and is recorded by the sensor. And it records the time it takes to do that. By doing that, it's able to record the, essentially the 3D position of that point. Right? And um, the thing is it does that 50,000 times a second. And does this in a 360 rotation. It has a range of up to 200 meters. Uh, you can get ones with longer range. Uh, it records the X, Y, Z <coughs> position, but also it records using an optical digital camera color data, hard, uh, red, green, blue. Uh, it has an accuracy of plus or minus four to six millimeters, uh, to about 50 meters, give or take. Um, it also is, it's, it's launched by an, has an onboard touch screen with a stylus that you used, which is, I've used some earlier versions of scanners, and believe this, this thing is, is, is a godsend. In many ways, and also battery life is fantastic on it. You just use a small batteries too, lithium ion ones, instead of these giant NICADs used to other truck batteries. In some cases, it's used to lug around. Why do this? Well, it, it, rapid and accurate 3D recording for both cultural resource management, sort of monitoring purposes of the condition of the architecture, which is an issue in our sites. Um, it does give you complete flexibility once you've got the data from this in terms of sectioning it any way you wish to, to create any kind of 2D output if you want. Uh, you, you can do that, uh, but it can also serve as a basis for 3D modeling, and that's sort of the next stage. We have a, we've just sort of beginning with that, really. Um, the laser scanner creates a point cloud. This is just a generic example from, from the University of Arkansas, but as it zooms in, you can see that it's not actually a solid surface. It's made up of various points. Um, and so scanning, uh, you need to clean these scans to remove extraneous data. You're always going to get vegetation and things in them that need to be removed. Um, you're not going to capture a building in a single scan, so you need to then register or join the scans together. And then in the software, it will create solid surfaces from these points using various algorithms. <laughs> and there's, uh, there's the Pithos Hall of Building 10. This is about six, uh, uh, sorry, three scans have been registered together, so that's full 3D, um, and if we zoomed in really tight, you'd see the little points which those are made up of. And we didn't just use that to explore, uh, record the extant architecture, we decided also to use it as a recording tool for our excavations, and these, this is a shot of the, the test stretch I showed you uh, earlier in full um, 3D, just to, you know, you have to have the requisite animations, um, I think it's still work. So this is that, uh, this is the laser scans put together. Slightly lower resolution just so it will actually work on this computer. These are vast, vast files. Um, but, you know, and then you can go in and section that uh, any way you wish. You can use measuring tools to measure any single stone on that. You can draw that any, any way you wish. Uh, and the other thing you do is, uh, this is an example from a project I've involved at Machu Picchu, where you can automatically extract architectural features from these, these kinds of scans as well. 
so that's another possibility of these. And uh, just one other interesting laser scan uh, project we're involved in. This is probably the harbor of Calabasas size to me, it's about three kilometers away. And um, it's uh, a site that's eroding out of the shoreline. Uh, we're rapidly losing this site every season. And so, you know, for instance, these architectural features, like there's this pithos here, there's this stone line pit, those were gone between the seasons of us uh, sort of returning back to the site. And so it made sense to laser scan this, which we have done. We did it again last season, and so once we finish processing the stuff, we'll have an exact measurement of how much of this site we're losing, in addition to having actually recorded it in full, uh, full detail. And just uh, one other method I want to mention that is, I think, going to start to replace laser scanning for a lot of the stuff is photogrammetry, essentially using overlapping photos uh, to derive 3D information. And uh, we did this sort of work as well. There's that same trench uh, being processed in software called PhotoScan, where you essentially take a bunch of overlapping photos, dump them into the software, and it produces uh, spectacular 3D models, perhaps slightly less accurate than the laser scanner, but it's, it's pretty close, I must say. I mean, I would, we're super impressed with this. This just came out in the last uh, year and a half or so, and it's really going to revolutionize this kind of 3D uh, work. You see all the photos in blue uh, that are overlapping. So 77 photos generated uh, somewhat over 300, well, close to 400,000 XYZ coordinates uh, using this software. And it's the, this is, uh, and I exported this by, as a PDF. This is a PDF in Adobe. It's in full 3D. You can manipulate it and you can just go in and measure anything you like uh, using um, Adobe uh, Acrobat. <laughs> Uh, and that's just the photos that, that went in to generate this model. And you know, we we're also doing some aerial aspects of this in terms of um, last year we used a kite, which uh, is great. You can you can anchor a camera on this thing and get these overlapping photos, and then you can dump those into photo scan and georeference them in pro version. So you can uh, then have these these wonderfully uh, georeference three D models of the terrain of the site, for instance. Um, obviously, this relies on wind. And so uh, we decided to go one better, and this thing was quite, quite sinister. <laughs> the octocopter, the sinister octocopter, which uh, has undergone maiden flights down in Arkansas. We'll be taking this to Cyprus, and you can uh, use um, digital cam. You can anchor a digital camera to this. We're also going to do some aerial thermography. In other words, a, a, a camera that senses heat differentials on the surface, which might indicate buried subsurface architecture. So we're going to experiment with that next year as well. It does fly, I'm told. More, much more than that, I, can't, I haven't seen the thing in action. But uh, there you go. We'll have that uh, to test out. Looks like something from Star Wars. Or and and the, the, one of the objectives of this is to then uh, create 3D models based on this. And I'm just going to shamelessly plug my colleague Dave Frederick's uh, Workshop this afternoon, this is some of his work from uh, the Digital Pompeii project, but it's, it's it using Unity, and, and this is the kind of direction that we want to go with, with this data to produce um, some realistic uh, visualizations. And we started think with this, uh, doing this with ArcSeam, and this is part of ArcGIS, uh, looking at the terrain in around the side, we're getting to model that. And um, we, we are under, undergoing now integrating all this data into ArcGIS, so we have a number of uh, various layers of of archaeological data along with hydrology and uh, cadastral maps of field boundaries and things like that. And, uh, just to, then we got a student who's working on trying to do some of that space syntax stuff using ArcGIS as well. Matt Tenney is, is doing some great work with that. And uh, I, I also need to plug my employer, current employers, the uh, Crane Project, and eventually we'll integrate our. Cypriot data into this wider ancient Near East project that I'm involved in. This would be a whole other talk in its own right. You can check out our, our website. It's just getting underway. This is a multi million dollar social sciences humanities research funded project based at the University of Toronto, but uh, Chicago, Cornell, there's a Durham University in the UK. A number of schools are involved in this, uh, this project, and we'll eventually bring it into this, this uh, data integration framework. And, uh, just a few general conclusions about my work particularly, my sort of research work and, and, and as regards to these digital methods. Um, but I, I think these are going to really revolutionize the way that archaeologists work in the field in terms of recording. That sort of thing. And um, my project, this, this project will continue. We're going to apply for a new round of funding. And uh, it's, um, uh, as well as develop a program for the conservation and interpretation of 
the Calabasas site, which will involve an augmented reality component that we're going to start to, uh, to work on. And I'll just, I'll just leave you with this. This is just some, some issues that arise in, in you know, the idea of the, the software being a black box that people can sort of dump stuff in and spit things up. But do we really understand what it went into the final product that these things produce? This is a big issue. Um, the, the, the processing power and storage required by these giant files I've been showing you is a huge issue. It's easy to gloss over that, uh, but you really need to have a plan in place to deal with that. Uh, metadata, um, the reliability of the equipment under field conditions can give you a litany of issues that have arisen from the fact. Um, and also, speaking of some of the stuff Rebecca was talking about, you know, I think we need to start integrating these digital methods very well in our uh, teaching. Right, thank you.